Good morning. My name is Michael Palmer and I'm the founder and owner of French Hill Apiaries in St. Albans, Vermont in the U.S. And um, we run an apiary of around a thousand colonies uh, producing bees, queens, and honey. First, I, before I get started, I just want to say how pleased I am to be invited back to the National Honey Show. In 2013, when I first went over and you all started doing your YouTubes, the fact that my YouTubes were um, recorded by you is just, it, they've gone around the world, they've gone viral. I have, been, I have been around the world because of those videos. And so I just want to tell you how great it is to be back. My presentation today is a year at French Hill Apiaries where I like to show the management that we do. And instead of tying our management to the calendar dates, I'd like to at least try to link our management to bloom periods. Well, we're gonna start in winter, of course, because winter here is, seems like it's a half a year all the time. It, so there's not a lot to do in the winter. Everything is covered with snow. There's my house and my old cow. And so the bees are all tucked away for the winter. And the snow piles up deep and deep and deep. And so what we do in the wintertime is work in the wood shop and build equipment, repair equipment, think, plan. A lot of the thinking goes on during the wintertime because there's not much else to do. So let's start in early spring. We're going to check the si cluster size and the food levels of the colonies. So this is what I'm hoping to see. I'm hoping to see nice, large clusters, um, maybe with some honey. The one on the left, I can see honey around the cluster, so that one's fine. But what about the one on the right? That makes me nervous. And so I dig around with my hive tool and I look for some honey. And if this colony doesn't have any honey to eat, if I can't find honey, I need to feed them. We look for cluster size. This is a, a smallish cluster. I can see it goes down inside the combs. But it's a small cluster and they have honey. This is a larger cluster, but things don't really look right. In fact, that cluster is dead because it's starved to death. So you see what happens is they started raising brood and they used up all their honey before I could get around to feed them and they starved. Well, in the winter time, we can't really feed syrup. Feeding, feeding syrup in the winter before the bees can fly is uh, just um, uh, asking for issues with dysentery and so, in the, in the winter, when, they're, when they can't fly, we feed them fondant if they're low on food, which is, you know, a soft sugar. We also feed them pollen substitute. Pollen substitute is a, is a high protein um, uh, patty used um, to supply them their protein that they need. And they really love it. I, they, just, they just suck it right down. Well, the reason we do this is the bees the bees start raising brood in the spring and they need protein and the protein they use was stored last autumn from goldenrod and asters and other, other fall blooming plants and they preserve that pollen under honey and then in the spring there's protein available for them to raise babies. But what happens if they run out of protein? Then they stop raising brood. And raise, uh, a brood cessation in the spring is really a dangerous thing. The bees are getting old. They're starting to lose their, their field force as they work out in the field. And the po colony population begins to dwindle. And they need to be replacing that population with new bees. But if they can't raise new bees because they ha have a lack of protein, the colony dwindles, it's called spring dwindling, and many colonies can die because of that. So we give them a protein to get over that hurdle until the first protein, uh, until the first pollens are available. 
Now, some people don't like to use artificial protein, artificial pollen substitute, as it's called. So you can actually trap pollen and fill combs and put that full pollen comb next to the brood, and they'll use that instead of artificial pollen substitute. So finally, in, in, um, in March, you know, we go from about November sometime until March or even April before there's a cleansing flight. And the bees can't defecate until they have a cleansing flight. And so they're going all winter long and finally we have a day that's warm enough for them to have a general flight and out they come and out comes their defecate and it's all over the place. Good day to wear a hat to the bee yard. Another thing they need at this time of year, remember everything is frozen here. This is winter here in Vermont and all the, all the liquid is frozen and they can't gather liquid. So they'll even, when it's a warm day on first cleansing flight day, they'll even land on the snow to try to suck up some of the melting snow. <clears throat> and so that first cleansing flight day, you can see what the snow looks like. It's covered with, with feces. But this is a good thing. And the first reel of water that's available to them is, is on the outer cover, on the lid. When the snow and the ice melt and it's warm enough for the bees to fly, this is where they get their first drinks of water. And then, then the sugar makers, the sap starts to run in the maple trees and the sugar makers are boiling it down. And now spring really starts to break. And now we can feed sugar syrup. So colonies that are light on feed, once they, they can fly regularly, once the bees can fly regularly, we can start feeding them sugar syrup. And it's the same thing as with pollen substitute and protein. If the bees run out of uh, feed or they start getting low on feed, they'll shut down brood rearing right at the wrong time of year when brood rearing needs to be increasing, not decreasing. Finally, before I start to get our first blooms, this is poplar. We call it poplar. It's not poplar. It's trem Populus tremuloides, which is quaking aspen. And it moves into alders. I believe you all have alders in the, in the UK, in the British Isles. This is one of our very earliest pollens. And then it moves into the maple, the maple bloom. This is the first uh, significant uh, nectar flow. I've seen very many colonies on the brink of starvation get saved by the nectar flow from maple trees. So this is happening, oh gosh, April, middle of April to the end of April. <clears throat> and then the willows. Willows are, are probably uh, the first really good pollen flow and um, this is, and so in, in order to show you what I mean by a pollen flow, I took this colony and I plugged up the entrance with grass. So the bees would accumulate on the side of the hive. And oh my gosh, look at how much pollen is coming into this colony. So this is what I'm talking about. When we reach this point, we're pretty much over the winter. So once we've gone around and checked all the honey production colonies, we have to check the overwintered nucleus colonies. We run some place 500 or more nucleus colonies through the winter. And they're all wrapped up for winter, but we do the same thing. We open them up, we check them for feed, we check them for pollen substitute, make sure they have, uh, they have protein. And this is what we're looking for. These are the kind of colonies that I, I'm looking for. This is um, probably an eight comb nucleus colony on each side. So there's two nucleus colonies here. Snow has just melted. The colonies are still wrapped for winter. And look at the population in those. And all of those, those colonies were made the previous summer with, with very limited resources and allowed to build up into these colonies and overwintered. And this is what we have in the spring. These are our heifers. There's another one. These are our heifers. You know, a dairy farmer, heifers are the replacements for the old cows. These are my heifers. These are my replacements for my old colonies. And then we have this, this other bloom. It's called uh, Colt's foot. 
and I never believed Colt's foot uh, was worked with, by the bees, but it is, and look at that. Sometimes there's multiple bees on each flower. It's a wonderful plant. Now we can take our winter wraps off. So this is a production colony, a uh, apiary, wrapped for winter. And this is a nucleus colony apiary wrapped for winter, beginning to be unwrapped. So we take the wrappers off. As we're doing this, I'm looking for signs at the, uh, at the entrance to the colony. Is the colony alive? Is it vibrant? Without opening this colony, I look at the cleanings that are coming out of the colony and I know this is a good house cleaning colony that has the strength to clean up all the refuse that's gathered during the winter time. This is an excellent thing. And we're looking for cluster size. This is a beautiful uh, colony of bees that's come through the winter, packed with bees still in the spring. So once we've gone around and, um, and made sure everybody's got enough uh, feed, um, we've got them unwrapped, now it's time to start supering. We need to get the supers on early. This, the, the, our first major nectar flow is from dandelion. And this can be any time in the early to mid-May. And once, once this, uh, this flow starts, if we don't have supers on, the nectar goes in the brood nests. And it plugs up the brood nest. And so that, that causes swarming. We need to get some nectar storage room above the active brood rearing cluster. And so this is how we do it. We get our supers on. Um, Gosh, in April sometime, you know, way before the flow. So now we've got supers on the production colonies so that if the flow comes and we're busy doing something else, the, the colonies aren't going to swarm. Now we're transferring our, all those 400 nucleus colonies into shipping containers because we sell a lot of them. And so here we are making up cardboard nuke boxes, checking for the queens, the queen has to go in the shipping box. If the queen isn't, if you don't actually actively spy that queen, there's a chance that the queen didn't go in the nuke and then we get in trouble when we sell it with a queenless nuke, so. And we're fixed, setting up 10 frame colonies in Langstroth's, making new colonies. And then we get our first major flow. So this is about uh, the first half of May. And it's from dandelion. And everybody gets some dandelions. You all get dandelions. Everybody gets dandelions. Not dandelions like we get dandelions. I mean, when this nectar flow starts, it's, it's like you died and gone to heaven. Look at that. And it's just everywhere. And, it's, and the apples come on. And so you have this dandelion fruit bloom, as I call it. And this is the first major, major flow of the year. We, f we, can fill, we can fill supers of honey on this flow. And because it's such, an, uh, such a major flow, it can promote swarming. Now, what do you do about swarming? Swarming is all about population management how to manage the population to, to maintain strong, productive colonies, but in the meantime, they won't swarm. Like this, beautiful cluster. Or this, or this, <laughs> or this, okay. So what can we do? Well, we could split the colonies we can make an artificial swarm or we can take a nuke out of the bees and brood away from the colony and give it more room and knock down the population and, and try to prevent these colonies from swarming. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the ways that we, uh, we employ to um, prevent swarming is it entails reversing the brood, brood chamber and equalizing brood among the colonies. 
Now, you, you all, a lot of you have single broods or a brood in a super. Well, I can't run my bees on single broods and brood in a super. I need, I need two broods in a super. Because we have such an intense buildup in the spring that single broods and a brood in a super, that everything would be swarming. So, we reverse the order of the, the boxes. So the top box is on the bottom and the bottom box is on top. Now when do we do this? Well, we try to do this, we try to do this before the dandelion bloom. So let's see what we've done so far. A couple weeks before this, we added supers. And so the early nectar flows are going in the supers. Now below those two supers is my brood nest with two, two broods and a super. Now if we hadn't put those supers on there, the nectar comes in and it goes in the brood nest, right? It's like in a tree. When a colony is in a cavity in a tree, there's nobody to put supers on. There's nobody to manage the colony. The colony has gone up through the brood nest and is now at the top of the, of the, of the brood nest where the remainder of the honey is. And then the nectar comes in, and where are they going to put the nectar? Well, they're going to put it in the top root box. But what else is in the top root box? There's brood in the top root box, but there's nowhere for them to store the nectar. So as the brood emerges, they store the nectar in the, emerging, in the cells of the emerging brood. <clears throat> this sets up a competition between nectar storers and brood rearers and it forces the queen down into the colony because the top is being packed with incoming nectar and that downward pressure caused by that incoming nectar when there's no supers on the colony is the main key in my opinion for swarming so that's what we're trying to do number one with early supering that gives the bees a place for overhead nectar storage, so it doesn't go in the brood nest. But as the incoming nectar increases, we have to do something again to give overhead nectar storage and overhead room for the queen to lay. So we take the supers off, we lay the colony on the ground, we check the colony, we crack it apart, and we look at the bottom of the, we look at the bottom of the top box. That's where the, the brood nest is. And we're looking for swarm cells. And there they are. So you see what's happened is that even though there were supers on this colony, the incoming, the strength of that incoming flow has kicked off swarm preparations. So now what do we do? We cut out all the, all the cups, all the queen cups with eggs and larvae and queen cells, and we reverse the colony. Well, the boxes on the bottom are pretty much empty. And so when we reverse the colony, we're taking brood comb and putting it above the active brood rearing cluster, allowing the queen to move up. And it's that upward movement of the queen and her cluster that takes that pressure off, that swarming pressure. So we can raise gigantic colonies of bees and they don't swarm. And so now you see this colony has now been reversed. The brood nest order is reversed. The first two supers on are getting full and we add another super. And as long as after, afterward, during, uh, during the honey production time, as long as we keep ahead of them in supers. You know, it takes two supers of nectar to make one super of honey. And so they need extra storage room for all that nectar because nectar is 85% water and honey is 85% sugars and they have to get rid of that water and that water is volume. So now, we've done our second round of supering. So we supered once, we reversed, and we're supering again as we're reversing, and we're putting one or two more supers on, so now they have four supers on already, and it's only the middle of May. 
But this is what we need because our flow is so intense. So what have you accomplished in this reversing? Comb space above the cluster so the queen can move up and that downward pressure is taken away. And nectar storage above the cluster so that nectar isn't going in emerging brood. It's going out to the side and above, which is where it should be. Now, because we've got the colonies apart at this time of year, this is a great time to evaluate the queen. You sit down and you look at the brood, you're looking for queen cells anyway, and so you, now you can evaluate the, 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 the quality of your queen. This is the kind of a brood pattern I'm looking for. I'm looking for this, uh, th this beautiful white pearly larvae. Every larva, every cell is full. Every larva next to another larva is almost the same age. The queen is laying and it, she's just filling the, the comb space like this. That is a nice queen. And an, and an unsealed pattern like that becomes a sealed pattern like this. And this is what we're looking for. This, on the other hand, is not so good. Empty cells, larvae of different ages, all, all mixed up together, no cohesive pattern. These need to be requeened. This is another example of a colony that needs to be requeened. You have old brood, young brood, empty cells, eggs, all scattered, all scattered together. The queen is not laying in a nice circular pattern. She's all over the place. This colony needs to be requeened. This colony has a terrible pattern. Another one, shotgun pattern is called. This colony needs to be requeened. And again, the queen isn't able to keep up. The pollen gatherers are coming in with this huge pollen flow. They plug the whole brood nest with, with pollen. The queen has nowhere to lay. This queen should have been replaced already. This one obviously should be replaced. This is a laying worker. This is a failed queen. There is no queen in this hive. The worker bees take over, start laying eggs. Of course, they're unfertilized, and only drones result in this. Colony needs to be requeened. Now, sometimes you'll find colonies that have multiple eggs in the cells, but that's because it's a new queen or a queen that doesn't have enough support staff, so she has to keep laying, but she can't expand her cluster. So this is how I tell, positively, that what I'm seeing is a drone layer. I mean, excuse me, is a laying worker. Queen cups with multiple eggs like this is pretty much definitive of the laying worker colony. And because we are now got the colonies apart and we're, we're inspecting, we're, we're, we're evaluating the queens, this is a great time to do your first disease check of the summer. You want to see nice pearly white brood like this. You want to see sealed brood patterns like this. This is not what you want to see. This is um, sunken cappings. Uh, dead, dead brood. Um, this is American fowl brood disease, one of the most deadly diseases, if not the most deadly disease we have. It's a spore-forming bacteria, and once the spores are in the hive, they're viable for 70 years or, or, or maybe forever, certainly a, a lifetime, and the only way to get rid of it is to burn it. So when you find American fowl brood, you burn it. This is another brood disease called European fowl brood. Um, this is increasing in our, in our region. I know you're having problems with it in, uh, in the UK. Um, this is also caused by a bacteria, but it's not a spore-forming bacteria. Uh, this is another disease. This is a virus called sac brood. The, um, the pupa gets a little sac around it. It's a virus. There's really nothing you can do except requeen the colony. Uh, this is a fungal di disease called shock brood. Um, re in, um, requeening this colony with a, with a hygienic strain of bees will, will eliminate the shock brood and you'll never see it again. So now we've gone through, we've, uh, we've, we've supered, we've reversed, and in its, we're in the dandelion fruit bloom 
and it's time to start setting up our cell builders. And this is when we do it, dandelion fruit bloom. So the brood that I, I harvest to boost my cell building colonies into a massively strong colony so I can get the best queen cells I can get, I harvest brood from what I call brood factories, which are nucleus colonies whose entire reason for existence is to make me brood for setting up cell builders and for making nucleus colonies. So here's a, here's a group of four nucleus colonies that are getting very strong. It's right about the dandelion bloom, and I, I begin harvesting brood from them. Even though I harvest brood from them, they're still getting stronger and stronger. So this is a brood factory yard. And I go around from nuke to nuke, and I take a frame or two of brood away from each one. And I take enough so that they won't swarm before I get back there again, maybe in a couple of weeks, but not so much that they dwindle. And because I boost these colonies, that colony on the photo on the left is a real strong cell builder. Um, colony and the queen right part is below the queen excluder and the cell building part before I graft into it is above and on grafting day I separate it and I, sh I shake the bees, the nurse bees, into my, into my cell building unit which is now queenless but packed, packed with bees. And so I put my graft into that. Do my graft for my breeder colonies. You know, I have a number of breeding colonies of, of queens that I like to graft from that I'm trying to uh, propagate their genetics. And, um, <clears throat> and these queens all come from my own apiaries. I don't buy in queens. I don't buy in stock. I evaluate my bees and I pick the best stock, local stock stock that, uh, that grows in my apiary under my management and that I've kept records for years. <clears throat> so once we've got the, um, the grafting done, the first round of grafting done, um, the day before the queen cells are ready to harvest, we have to set up the mating nukes. So these are the mating nukes. The way they've been, uh, they've been overwintered. There's actually two boxes on each mating nuke, and uh, my mating nukes are four ways, and that get reduced to two ways, and then put on top of another one, and so that I'm actually wintering each queen. There's two queens in each of those stands. Each queen has 16 combs, and we overwinter them that way, and then the day before the queen cells are ready, we break them back down into four ways, queenless four ways, and take them to the, um, to the mating yard. And so here we are setting up cell builders, I mean, excuse me, setting up mating nukes from one of the uh, groups of overwintered nukes. And now we're into more of the summer flowers, the summer flow. This one is honeysuckle. Great, great flow of very mild um, white honey. Or our, these are our, our brambles. <clears throat> I think your brambles are much later in the season. This is early June and the brambles. And this is blackberry, gray pollen. I think you have gray pollen too over there, don't you? And because we make such huge, well-stocked cell builders, this is the kind of uh, results we get on the queen cells. Enormous queen cells, still packed with jelly on the day we harvest the cells. Every one of those pupa got more jelly than it could possibly eat. And that's where I think quality comes in. So the first queens, our first queens are, are available every year. Um, mm, let's see, June 13th, I believe, is pretty much every year. So the crew goes out and catches queens. We catch about, I think it's 128 uh, every four days. And here's, uh, here's Kate and Tucka, and then here's uh, Kirsten and, uh, and our friend from, um, 
from New, uh, Rhode Island. She's a Chinese national. And so lots of people come to visit us. Kirsten was the editor of American Bee Journal. So people come from all over the place and around the world to, to spend time with us um, as we're catching queens. And so here's, a, here's a, a reasonably good catch for the day. Well, now that we have um, queens available, now we can start setting up our nucleus colonies for overwintering. So this is happening about the 14th or the 15th of June. And now we're into another um, summer honey plant. This is called sumac, staghorn sumac. A wonderful plant. A little bit finicky, but in the right weather, this makes a beautiful vanilla flavored honey. Orange pollen, really a nice plant. And our clovers. And our vetches, it's another legume, and alfalfa. And so now these are the, the brood factories. You know, even though we're taking brood out of them every once a week, every other week, they get hugely populous. And you have to keep adding combs to them, combs to them, or they're going to swarm, even though we take brood away. So now we have queens available to catch, queens on my table in the living room, and now we can start making our nucleus colonies. I like to make nucleus colonies on the main honey flow, which starts about middle of June and goes till about middle of July. See, we have one month of, of good honey flow. <clears throat> so I also like to get my nucleus colonies to draw foundation. So if I make these nucleus colonies up on the main honey flow, They'll draw out four or six frames of foundation over the summer, giving me new combs, which is invaluable in my operation. <clears throat> so we're pulling out frames of brood, setting up nucleus colonies. So we'll set up probably 300, 350 nucleus colonies between middle of June and middle of July. Um, we're using about a frame and a half or two, two frames of brood in the early made nucleus colonies. But once we get to the 1st of July, 4th of July, somewhere in there, we start making them a little bit stronger. See, I still want them to draw a foundation. But if we make them up in the early July and let them build up until for a couple of weeks and then try to get them to draw foundation, and what's happened is that the flow has ended and they can't draw foundation because they just aren't strong enough. So we make them a little stronger than, than two frames. We, we might use three frames of brood after the 1st of July, which, which really builds them into a nice colony, ready to go for the autumn flow. So now we have to do our third round of supering. Well, what does this entail? Supering for calm honey. I want my calm honey, basswood and sweet clover. And the sweet clover basswood flow is about the very end of, of June until the middle of July. So here's the, here's the linden trees, American basswood, Tilia, Amer Tilia americana. You call it lime. These are our lime trees. And so I try to get them, I want this honey in my comb honey. It doesn't crystallize. It's, got, it's like eating candy. It's the most beautiful, flavorful honey for comb honey. White, white cappings. But it takes a real strong colony to make comb honey. This is the kind of, of apiary I use to make my comb honey. The pink boxes are comb honey boxes. Okay? So look at, the, look at the bees. Look at the surplus bees in these things. This is what it takes to make comb honey. So now we've got, our, we've got our nucleus colonies made. We're done by the middle, by the 10th or the 15th of July. We're still catching queens. We still have queens available. So now we do our midsummer requeening. We identify the colony to be requeened. Now why would that be? Poor brood pattern, a poor honey producer. I've got records over a number of years. We can follow these colonies and see that they're, they're consistently making below the average crop in the apiary. 
or chalk brood. Chalk brood is that, bee, that brood disease, that fungal brood disease I showed you. The chalk brood is a very good marker for, for um, hygienicness. And so if a colony that doesn't show chalk brood when others do is an excellent uh, um, candidate for, for breeding hygienic bees. And hygienic bees will, will rid the colony of brood disease before it becomes contagious. So we've identified our, our, um, our colony to be requeened. And now how do we requeen it? We, we, uh, there's a number of, right, there's a number of uh, ways. Direct introduction, well, we can use the mailing cage and pop the cork off the candy end and put them in the, in the, put that queen in the colony after we've re dequeened that colony. And more often than not, they'll accept that queen. Well, you've, re you've removed the first queen, but is there a second queen in that, in that colony that needs to be requeened? How many times does this happen? That you take the queen, but there was a second queen, and, they, and she will kill your introduced queen. Okay, you can also requeen with nukes, nucleus colonies. Very good way to requeen with nucleus colonies. Re Dequeen the colony, give it the nucleus colony with a laying queen, and they accept her very well. What we use mostly are push-in cages, little wire cages that we can locate, that we can isolate the new queen on combs in the colony after the queen, colony has been dequeened and leave her there until she gets accepted and she can start to lay. So here's a frame of brood. We've removed the old queen from the colony. We, we locate a, col a comb that has emerging brood and nectar, brush all the bees off, locate the cage over emerging brood and nectar with no bees, put the queen under the cage and push the cage into the midrib of the comb and put that colony back in the hive. Right back in the colony. Push the combs together, close it up. This, this queen stays there in that cage for four days. Why four days? How long do, when do, when do eggs hatch? They hatch on the third day. So if we leave that cage, queen under that cage for four days, there should be no eggs in the colony, correct? So you, pu you, you, you pull the uh, comb with the cage on it, and you look at the comb outside the cage. Are there any eggs? If there are eggs, guess what? You had a second uh, queen in that colony, and she needs to be removed before you can re redo the cage. This gives you a second chance. So here she is. The queen of the cage has been re removed. The push-in cage has been removed. She hasn't been, in, she hasn't been out among the general population for, for more than 30 seconds or a minute. And look at, they're already starting their retinue. They've already ex uh, accepted her. Why is that? When you requeen with a caged queen, she's not a laying queen. She's a mated queen, yes. Is she a laying queen? No. As soon as I catch these nice fat queens and I put them in a cage on my table overnight, tomorrow morning they're skinny, short little things. They don't smell, they don't act like a laying queen, they don't smell like a laying queen. You put them in a colony, they come out of the cage, they don't act like a laying queen, and sometimes the bees object. But when she's underneath the cage for four days, she starts to lay, she plumps up, they feed her, and then, because now she's a laying queen, she's been brought into lay, now when you remove the cage, she's a laying queen, the bees just accept her and love her right away. Well, sometimes it's not so easy to find the queen. You've been there. I mean, what, what do you do when you can't find the queen? Come back the next day? Well, do you have any better chance of finding her the next day? This is, a, this is a typical thing. They're looking for a queen. Well, I mean, there's four people there looking for a queen in four, in four different spots. I mean, really? Where is she? She's in there somewhere. Well, what I do is I made a shaker box. 
And a shaker box is no more than a, than a serviceable um, brood, brood box with a queen excluder nailed on the bottom. And I can take the colony down, right down to the bottom, take all the combs out, put my shaker box on top of the empty box down below, shake the bees into the shaker box and, and reinsert the, the combs, now beeless combs, underneath the shaker box and the, the bees will go back down through the queen excluder to get onto the brood, leaving the queen and the drones behind and there she is. Now we're into harvest, so we've done our requeens. We've done all our, our summer work. We've done all our requeens to try to replace any failing queens, any queens that are questionable. Now we're into honey harvest. Now are we going to take it all? No, we're not going to take it all. And feed back sugar, we could do that. But you see that, those dark bands in the top box? That's the bee's protein. That's the bee's protein that they need next spring. And if you take that box away and take their honey and just feed them sugar so they have enough carbohydrates, they don't have any pollen. And how are they gonna raise any brood next spring to replace the bees that are dwindling? You need to leave that box on. So this is harvest. These are the kind of honey crops we get some years. You know, 250 or more pounds of honey. Unfortunately, the deeps always <laughs> seem to be on the top, and so it's a struggle to get them down. But at the same time you're doing harvest, now we have something we have to deal with that I didn't have to deal with when I was early in my career, varroa mites. And so what do we do about this? You can't treat uh, with honey supers on because it would contaminate the honey. So as soon as you get the, the honey off, you need to, you need to sample to find out what your varroa populations are, and you, and you need to treat with whatever it is you're going to treat with. This is a colony that's uh, crashed from varroa mites. You can see the poor bees died as they tried to come out. They're all full of virus. They don't have any wings. They have a sh short, short, flattened abdomen. The bee in the middle is pretty much what they're supposed to look like when they emerge from their cells. Long wings, plump abdomen. Look at the other two. No wings, fat, uh, flat, stunted abdomen. This is caused by viruses, caused by varroa mites. You need to, you need to treat your bees for varroa mites or whatever it is you do to, to mitigate that this ex exploding varroa population needs to be done. Now what we do is we sample. We sample about uh, when, we're, when we're doing our requeens. We do our sampling with an alcohol wash. And this uh, little bottle here with the screens, you shake it and you, we put 300 bees, shake it up in alcohol, the mites fall off, <clears throat> there should be on the bottom. This is what we're wanting to see. I'm wanting to see zeros. I don't want to see fives and tens and fifteens and thirties. I want to see zeros. I know that our treatments are working over the year. I know our treatment is working if we find zeros. So then we get into the autumn flow. Loosestrife, purple loosestrife, a European plant, goldenrod, bone set, all kinds of plants that asters, asters are huge. Goldenrod, wonderful plant, um, uh, knotweed makes a beautiful dark honey and it's wonderful to winter on. Asters, we have a lot of different asters. This is maybe flat top. Um, New England aster, um, not sure of this kind, but it's a really good late pollen and sometimes nectar flow, which helps with our wintering. So now that's done with and we have to do our winter preparations. First off, make sure you don't have any disease going into the winter, especially AFB. If you have AFB going into the winter, the colony dies in the winter, and in the spring your other colonies rob it out, taking the disease home, and now it spreads through your apiary. Never, never take an AFB colony into the winter. We want to check cluster sizes. We need to have big clusters going through our winters because we have such a long cold winter. 
This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for bee colonies that are hives that are packed with bees. <clears throat> now we have to make sure they have enough feed. My, my colonies here in, in northern Vermont need 70, 80 pounds of honey. And how would I know that? How would I know there's 70 or 80 pounds of honey? Well, so when do we feed? We feed after the goldenrod flow is finished. So the goldenrod, when they're ripening goldenrod nectar, it has a very, very strong flavor, uh, odor. Some people say that it smells like uh, dirty, dirty gym socks. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't abide by that. I think it smells wonderful. I think it smells ka-ching, ka-ching, because this is winter weight for us. This is, what, this is honey that's going to get our bees through the winter. So, how much? Well, I'm uh, feeding it, well, depending on what they need. Um, and how will I know that? Because I have a target weight, and I weigh every beehive. So achieving the target weight, I use a scale. It fits on my hive stand. I tip the hive sideways, slide the scale underneath it, tip the hive up, and weigh the colony. And my, uh, and my two broods in a, in a super with the bottom board and the crown board, or the inner cover if you will, need to weigh 155 or 160 pounds. And for every 10 pounds under that target weight, I give them one gallon of two to one syrup, two sugars and one water, 65% solution. And I feed it all. If, they, if they're 20 pounds light, I give them two gallons. I want to feed it fast. If you feed them with quart jars over a long period of time, they don't store any of it, they use it to raise brood. But when you feed it to them all at once, it comes in so fast, just like a nectar flow, that they can't use it. And in fact, by feeding the way I do, see it gets pretty cold, it's been, uh, been pretty frosty lately, and we're feeding bees. But by putting those cans on top of the combs on top of the frames, the bees go up around the cans and they warm the syrup before they can take it down. So here is we can feed up to five gallons. We can feed up to uh, 50 pounds of syrup at once and that will be gone in a week and less than a week and they just take it down. In fact, they'll cap it, they'll, they'll treat it like, like it was nectar. They'll cap it just like it was honey. You'll find, you'll find uh, wax flakes all over the entrance because the stimulation from the sugar is causing the bees' wax glands to work. And then we get our beautiful colors. This is pretty spectacular. This is my backyard. You know, this is, our area is just noted for, for uh, this, the, flaming, the flaming forest of the, of the autumn colors. So now we've got our, our feeding done. We're going to uh, have to wrap the colonies. Now, what do you mean wrap the colonies? Well, we put tar paper around them um, to absorb the heat from the sun because that black wrapper will warm up the inside of the hive enough on a cold sunny day in the winter that it'll just warm enough so that the bees can break the cluster a little, maybe bring some, uh, bring some honey into the cluster and, and so they don't get isolated and starved starve uh, on one side of the hive with honey not very far away. And, but this actually might cause moisture problems because we're wrapping the colony up and sealing it all up. This is a colony that is wrapped. Okay, the bottom entrance, we put a screen in the bottom entrance for mouse protection. A half inch hardware cloth screen. We have an upper entrance to allow some of the water vapor to vent out of the colony. We have inner cover insulation, crown board insulation to prevent condensation underneath and having it drip on the bees. Remember, we're, we're, we're below zero Fahrenheit. We're 20 below zero Fahrenheit. And they make a lot of, they make a lot of uh, moisture in their, in their uh, you know, from, from eating that honey. They give off a pound of honey, gives off something like, uh, like six-tenths of a pound of moisture. 
And that moisture needs to go someplace. And the black wrapper, as I said, is to, um, uh, for solar gain. So off to the bee yard with uh, what we need to wrap uh, an apiary. You know, the black wrapper, screen, a little duct tape, a little, uh, th this is, these are the tools that we use to wrap the colony. Cut the piece of paper that, to fit around the, around the colony, around the hive. So here's the hive we're, gonna, we're going to wrap. And the crown board is just covered with burr comb from the summer, so we have to scrape that off and cover the, uh, the crown board, the inner cover hole, and we put a piece of foam on this. Well, if that hole is open, the bees go up and they chew a hole in the foam. So we cover it with little duct tape. Now I've scraped the, the top, the, the crown board, smooth so that the foam will sit on the wood, not up in the air on the, on the burr comb. Then this is our, our mouse protection. It's a half inch hardware cloth wedge that, that fills the, the bottom entrance and it's jammed into the, into, the, um, into the entrance, the bottom entrance of the colony. And this allows plenty of ventilation, plenty of air ventilation to remove that excess moisture. Next. And this is what it looks like. Now this is our upper entrance. Now remember how much snow we get here. We can get a foot, two foot, three feet of snow in the winter time. The, the snow will be burying the colonies. The bottom entrances are, are iced over. There's no way that the bees are gonna come out. Well, what happens if we have a nice warm day in the middle of the winter, warm enough for the bees to fly and, and have a cleansing flight? You know, bees can't defecate till they can fly. They don't do it in the hive. Well, if I didn't have that upper entrance and the bottom entrance was iced over, the bees would never be able to take a cleansing flight until snow melt. So this is what we do. And we put the wrapper on, staple it on with a few staples. This is the upper entrance. You see the bees are already, already looking out the upper entrance, already saying what's going on. And here's your colony all wrapped up and ready for winter. A little bit of a forward tilt so, it won't, uh, so water won't collect on the bottom board. And here's a nice colony that's all wrapped up, ready to go. Sometimes we, we get an early snowstorm. And we like to try to wrap the bees before, before snow. So we had this one, was a couple years ago, we got two October snowstorms of over a foot. So we had to dig out everything, clean everything off, and then wrap. And, you know, they, they, did, they do all right. Like this. And I just wanted to say, you know, I'm, I'm never too, too worried about my bees in the winter because I have the old man of the mountain watching over them. <laughs> so here we go again. Now we're back into winter. Everything is freezing up. Here's our first snow of the year. The pond isn't even frozen yet. And the birds, they're just, these are our winter birds, chickadee, little chickadees, like your little tits. And when we really get some snow, to, and then the snow starts to pile up, and now we're working back in the shop again. So <clears throat> the winter time is the time when I get to travel. And so we've, my wife and I have been around the world, UK, Ireland, many times, New Zealand, Canada. Well, this trip I did into Mexico last November was really a highlight. I got a really lovely tour of the, of the, the state uh, of Oaxaca, which is on the Pacific coast in southern Mexico. And one of my, my main reasons for this trip was um, I was introduced to a school, a technical school, a high school, in Oaxaca City, and they teach, one of the things they teach is beekeeping. And the poor kids have, have bee suits that have broken zippers and, and gloves that, that, that have holes in them and veils that don't work. And so I started a fund me on Facebook and I was able to raise almost $7,000 for these kids and, you know, the people at the meeting, we, we're at a meeting here, at a seminar. 
and with local folks, local beekeepers. The people knew nothing about what was going on, nothing. The organizers knew. My friend Aurelio, my friend and, and interpreter Aurelio knew. And so they made us a, they made us a little a cardboard check. And these two wonderful, wonderful girls came up. And the people just absolutely flipped. They, they really could not believe this, you know. Mexico is, is one of the nicest places I've visited. The people there are so friendly. They're just awesome. And they can't do enough for me. I mean, when I'm done with a, 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 a meeting in a place like this, there are gifts on my, on my table, piled up on my table. Honey, avocados. Imagine a loaf of bread. Somebody gave me a loaf of bread. Well, do you know what that means? Do you know what that means to somebody? A loaf of bread? Just, just a wonderful place. And I hope to go back there again soon. So anyway, I just want to thank you again for, uh, for inviting me to uh, present to you today. And I just want to say cheers from the crew at French Apiaries. Mm -hmm.